Writing a story fit for the big screen is difficult. I know. There's no shortage of books, tutorials, advice, and channels like mine hoping to help. Every writer has to find their own way, their own process. What works for one will be the bane of their existence for many others. Looking at you, bolded sluglines. It's my enduring belief that every movie adheres to the exact same 29 point story structure, no matter which type of writer pens the tale. Ocean's Eleven is my exhibit C. A tight focus on the core elements of the protagonist's personality, inner conflict, and situation. Danny Ocean is a professional thief, stuck in a place where he can't steal anything. Sure, it's cheating to reference the sequel, but Ocean cannot turn off his brain. He sees all the angles so well that he can plan an impossible heist from hundreds of miles away. He leaves a lockup, empty-handed except for a reminder of his sacrifice better half, his wedding ring. Without delay, he begins to hunt down his wayward partner, starting with a local con man using a fake name and a quick check-in with his parole officer confirms that he can't leave Jersey while he's already planning to leave Jersey. Where, why, and how the protagonist exists in their world with the focus on why they don't quite fit in. Rusty is Ocean's sidekick, his second better half. He's treading water and staying busy until the next con job presents itself. It's a miserable experience when they're not on the job. Ocean's abrupt appearance is the most excitement Rusty seen since the last job went awry. He senses something is up. A singular event that's never happened before and is destined to lead the protagonist away from their status quo. Ocean schools Rusty and delivers him from the hell of hustler mediocrity. An examination of what's different in light of the something new, what's the same in spite of it, and how it deepens the conflict with the status quo. Reunited, Ocean clues his sidekick into the con job he's been obsessed with during lockup. They don't even waste time on an establishing shot to get started on cracking into the super duper mega vault at the Bellagio. Rusty redeems himself by proving he can read Ocean fairly well and calls him out on why this job needs to be pulled. He senses something is off. The discovery that things are less than ideal, or an exploration of how badly things are. Ruben, the self-proclaimed inventor of casino security, lays out unequivocally why this mission is impossible. Then they let Ruben talk himself into joining up anyway. The protagonist dedicates their effort to a specified goal, which is almost always smaller in scope or scale, to the primary objective that dominates the third act. Ocean and Rusty, funded by Ruben, jet across the United States to recruit a motley band of morally gray tradesmen. This sequence lasts over twice as long as any other in the movie, namely for the sake of catching each team member in their element. With such a massive ensemble cast, don't expect much character development. The beats of the story will instead focus on the narrative of the heist. A brief checklist of the story elements needed for the second act and how they might be utilized. Thieves assemble. We're told everything we need to know about the heist for dramatic purposes and the characters take one last breath before the job begins. A singular event that launches the protagonist into the wild jungle of the second act, also called an oh shit moment. They're supposed to just walk out of Las Vegas with a hundred fifty million stolen dollars. A whole shit. The protagonist must learn all new rules and expectations distinct to this adventure. The crew begin their recon, casino floor movement, security, quick exits out of the casino mazes, the city's power grid, surveillance and a dramatic close call with the token nervous guy to give us a taste of the anxiety. 
the protagonist showcases their ability to grow in the areas this adventure requires, typically through external means. The crew begins the physical construction of the replica vault. They acquire transportation. They invent a millionaire. And Linus proves his progress in amassing intel on their doom target, Terry Benedict. Characters face legitimate and understandable reasons to deviate from their stated convictions, agendas, or desires. Rusty questions if Ocean is capable of separating the heist from his own marriage hangups, possibly endangering everyone. Rusty passes his resolve, and Benedict fails his resolve to Tess by choosing appearances on camera over allowing her to give him affection. Ouch. Saul's resolve appears to be holding strong, but that ulcer is a beast of its own. A tightly packed series of problems that vex the protagonist at damn near every turn. Ocean confronts Tess, lays the groundwork for his own personal heist, his wife. Saul stares into the bangs of the beast and angles for access to the vault. Stone, cold, professional. The protagonist evolves internally by utilizing everything they've gathered and learned. Ocean engages Benedict, ex-husband versus boyfriend. Smelling something is off, Linus the rookie tails Ocean the pro. Then the heist finally goes awry when Basher's plan to kill the power grid is exposed before they can use it. Yen proves himself in the replica vault. Journey-weary characters reconcile the reality of their ongoing situation with who they were in the first act. Basher explains the critical fault in the plan, starting out by mentioning their plane rides back home, then helpfully solves the problem by talking it out, also helpful with exposition. Linus fails his loyalty to the heist at the expense of Yen. A singular event that strikes at the protagonist's core conflict. Ocean is compromised. His role in the heist will compromise the entire team. But if he steps away from the job, he loses his chance to win back Tess. Characters find a safe harbor that also provides needed answers for both external and internal conflicts. Linus cops to tailing Ocean. Rusty cops to ordering him to. And Ocean faces the very real danger of leading them all to the cops. Now we learn soon that some of the scene was exaggerated for the sake of testing Linus. Yet even if Ocean being compromised was part of the plan, he's still giving up direct control of both heists so he can be Benedict's distraction. It's still an uncomfortable prospect. Rusty preps Linus for his big boy job in the heist. The rookie made the cut, all right. The protagonist's clarified objective from the first act is realized in part or in whole, though it's meaningless without the completion of the primary objective. An unexpected war buddy threatens to derail the whole scheme. Though Saul keeps things on track, he's on Benedict's suspicion radar. Purely for the narrative of the heist, we're led to believe that Saul falls short of getting into the vault, despite his case making it in just fine. And although we're set to get Yen in position, he's also compromised. An existential conflict that wounds the protagonist's sense of self, worldly identity, and their journey. They lock Yen in, and the clock starts ticking. Linus swats away every attempt by Benedict to sniff a rat. The apparent death of Ocean's hope to win back Tess. The death of Frank's alias. Then the ploy is finally revealed as a long con pickpocket scheme, and now it all makes sense. Narrative rebirth. An undeniable win for the protagonist, typically in direct connection to the rebirth. With the pickpocket successful, Turk and Virgil are given the signal to deliver Yen, which signals Rusty into action, which signals Basher to set up. Then Yen and the case reach the vault. A grand loss directly connected to the protagonist's newfound inability to quit the journey. This sequence is all about misdirection. We think Ocean is about to get beaten, but nah, all part of the plan. 
Did Ocean and Rusty let Saul push himself too far? Nope, all part of the plan. Did Linus get caught? Nope, Ocean made it into the elevator shaft some other way. But for realsies, Basher's having troubles all on his own, and Yen's air is running out. A thematic freefall, tied directly to the heavy price. Boom, the power goes out in Vegas. Pandemonium. In the vault, simple bad luck could cost Yen and the heist. While Ocean and Linus deal with the guards packing Uzis. Yen almost trips the alarm. A singular event that robs the protagonist of seemingly any chance of success. Yen's bandages are wedged in the vault door, and Basher's EMP knocked out communication with the team. The protagonist cannot return to their starting persona and must turn to face the primary objective. Saved by dead batteries. Yen's safe, and now it's time to drive this heist into the final act. Rusty initiates contact with Benedict to pull his boys and the money out of the vault. And Tess gets to the bottom of the whole scheme just that quick. Hi, Rusty. The protagonist moves towards the climax while utilizing the major swings and sneaky misdirections of the story. We receive the first version of events and how it looks like the heist is playing out. The final confrontation between the protagonist and the antagonistic force. The veil is lifted for the audience and we get to see how the magicians pulled it off. Benedict pieces together some of the heist details himself. The singular event where the protagonist finally confronts their place in the status quo. Benedict confronts Ocean, and the only way Ocean gets out of this alive is to convince his nemesis that he's innocent. The direct aftermath of the climax, the cinematic denouement, if you will. Ocean uses the cameras against Benedict to show Tess exactly who Benedict is. Used and manipulated, Tess returns to her husband. Hmm. This is Ocean's resurrection though, not Tess's. So I guess it tracks. The consequences of the climax in relation to other characters and the status quo were treated to the iconic fountain scene where we're delicately assured that everything worked out just fine for everyone else. A tight focus on the protagonist contrasted from the opening. Ocean walks out of jail yet again. This time with BFF Rusty and the newly reminted Mrs. Ocean waiting for him. And there you have it, my third example to support my argument that all movies follow the exact same story structure, regardless of how the writer approaches their craft. Ocean's Eleven cleverly toys with the 29 point story structure, but it's all still there. So can we apply the outline of a complex Vegas con job to an iconic family-friendly holiday musical? Why yes, yes we absolutely can. Please subscribe to stay up to date with this and future videos, and please like and comment with your thoughts and reactions. I'll talk to you next time.